this is a story I'd never seen. This is a man fighting against the matriarchy, a man being told, you're not allowed to be brave like the women. I'd just never seen that world before. We sort of envisioned this book as part book, part activism and part like art object we see this book is like it's fallen through some kind of wormhole from some other universe where women are in charge and have always been and create an object like that you know it's not to be laughed at it's not like a jokey thing it's a serious book which looks at narrative language and archetypes which have permeated our culture for centuries Hello, welcome to The Story of Woman, the podcast exploring what a man-made world looks like when we see it through her eyes. Woman's perspective is missing from our understanding of the world. This podcast is on a mission to change that. I'm your host, Anna Steckline, and each episode, I'll be speaking with an author about the implications of her absence, how we got here, what still needs to be changed, and how telling her story will improve everyone's next chapter. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Story of Woman. We are going to start with a little thought exercise today. Imagine a world with princesses and shining armor, with kings longing for a child, where young men are rewarded for seeing past the flaws of beastly princesses. I'm talking about Handsome and the Beast, Jacqueline and the Beanstalk, Gretel, and Hansel. Now... Imagine a world where seductive male sirens lure brave heroines to their death, where Ikara and her mother fly too close to the sun, where beautiful men are forced to wed underworld queens. I'm talking about Persia and the Medusa's head, Atalantis, the male huntress, and the fall of Ikara. For thousands of years, Fairy tales and Greek myths have been told and retold. They form the basis of the stories and archetypes we still see in our films and our books and our media today. The brave, often brutal superhero men and the helpless maidens, wicked witches, and evil stepmothers. For literally thousands of years, these same kinds of stories with these same kinds of characters have been told. That is, of course, until our guest today decided to change that. Carrie Fransman and Jonathan Plackett are the authors and illustrators of two honestly revolutionary books, Gender-Swapped Fairy Tales and Gender-Swapped Greek Myths. And your first thought may be, well, we have stories like this already. Look at Brave, Moana, I don't know, Frozen maybe. But what Carrie and Jonathan did is different. Simple, but different. They swapped the genders of everyone in these stories. Kings became queens, heroes became heroines, she-bears became he-bears, and so on. And what that did is create entire characters and worlds that we have never seen before. So while modern takes on these stories might position girls and women as the fearless protagonist, those stories still take place within patriarchal societies. The women and girls are still pushing back against norms just to be brave and strong. And the men continue to lack basic human characteristics like empathy or the desire to be a father. So Carrie and Jonathan's books change the entire world these characters are living in, which creates new storylines and characters altogether. And it makes the power imbalances in these stories impossible to ignore. I just want to read a paragraph from the Greek myths book real quick to give you a sense of what I mean. Because as this is so unheard of, I think it's really hard to understand until you read it for yourself. So this is from the story of Persia and the Medusa's head otherwise known as Perseus and the Medusa's head. 
there was a queen of Argos who had but one child, and that child was a boy. If she had had a daughter, she would have trained her up to be a brave woman and a great queen. But she did not know what to do with this fair-haired son. When she saw him growing up to be tall and slender and wise, she wondered if, after all, she would have to die sometime and leave her lands and her gold and her queendom to him. And so the story goes on like this for the rest of it. And as you'll have just noticed, and you'll hear us discuss throughout our conversation, these stories don't create some kind of gender equal utopia. But what they do, in addition to telling stories that have never been told, is they make women the default gender, which brings to light just how unequal these narratives, and in turn our world, really are. So these are stories for girls, boys, non-binary and trans people, and adults. They shine a light on the gender binaries in our language, the roles we adopt within society, and the stories that we've been telling our children for generations. Carrie Franzman is a comic creator. She tells visual stories in books, newspapers, animations, sculptures, on iPads, and in virtual reality. Her comic strips and graphic stories have been published in The Guardian, The Times, Time Out, The Telegraph, The New Statesman, The Young Vic, and many, many more. Jonathan Plackett is a creative technologist, coder, game designer, and author with 15 years of experience working with advertising agencies. And fun fact, he also created the first automatic face swap app on the iPhone, which reached number one in the app stores. And he has created some viral websites, which were featured on BBC News, The Wall Street Journal, and more. In our conversation today, we talk about how this idea came about, the kinds of characters and worlds these stories create, why these stories are so important for people of all genders, and perhaps even more importantly for boys and men, given the increase in narratives around powerful women, but the continued lack of narratives around nurturing men or doting fathers. And as you will hear throughout, there is a huge need for more stories like this in literature, film, and every type of media. So if you're a creator or you want to become one, I hope you come away with some fresh ideas. I know I certainly did. And if you enjoy this episode, please consider taking a minute out of your day to rate and review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. It really helps people find the podcast. And I would so appreciate your help there. And don't forget to sign up to the Story of Woman newsletter to stay up to date with all things women and so you never miss an episode. But for now, please enjoy this binary busting conversation with Carrie and Jonathan. Hi, Carrie and Jonathan. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much for reaching out and thanks for waiting for me to grow a baby before, <laughs> before chatting. Yeah, congratulations. You've got a couple little ones now. And how old is your youngest? She literally won on Thursday. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and then we've got an almost five-year-old who's five on Saturday. Ah, She's like to oh, them very, very well. So <laughs> yeah. Her birthdays forever. <laughs> <laughs> That is very efficient. <laughs> well, I'm super excited to speak with you guys today about your books, Gender Swapped Fairy Tales and Gender Swapped Greek Myths. And these books are long overdue. So I'm super happy that you put them out into the world. And they are absolutely beautiful and quite revolutionary, I would say. So I just wanted to start by having you tell us a bit about them. What exactly are these gender swapped books about? And how did you come up with the idea? Well, first, thanks very much for saying all those very nice things about them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I guess the way they came about was so originally, the idea came from when when I was little, my dad used to tell me and my sister bedtime stories and used to gender swap some of the characters in the books. And now sort of fast forward God, what, like 35 years or something, <laughs> a lot of time. Now we're parents and we started thinking about the sort of messages she was receiving through, you know, the TV and books and everything we were watching. And that idea kind of came back to us. And there was another thing 
this is sort of slightly tangential reason. There was a um, some newspaper headlines that kind of triggered this idea of creating a gender swap algorithm. There was there were two female prime ministers here in the UK and Scotland, and they met for the first time, and all the newspaper articles were about their legs and their shoes. And I remember just thinking that that was insane. And imagine if that had been Barack Obama, it would have been at the time meeting our prime minister David Cameron, and all the all the newspaper articles were about the brogues they're wearing, or you know, <laughs> whether they'd shaved their legs or something like that. You'd have been like, the world's gone mad, right? But this, yeah, this normal kind of, you know, it was just oh, that's just a newspaper headline, fine. So that kind of got me thinking about this idea of making a gender swap algorithm, something that you could put any text into, and it would swap. You know, all the he's to she's, all the what turned out kings to queens, that kind of thing. But I was originally going to do it with the news. I showed this algorithm to Carrie and she had the idea of applying it to fairy tales. So we'd find these public domain fairy tales and put those into it. It would swap all the kings to queens, all the princes to princesses and swap the whole world and give us these entirely new stories, but identical otherwise to the original stories, but with all the genders swapped. It's quite interesting because the computer essentially is our author it's a non-biased system. It, you know, we put the words in, it swaps the language, and we get to read these completely original stories based in this matriarchal society. And then the observation is very much down to the reader to to see what they notice reading these stories. And it's marketed as both a, a book for adults and children. And I think it's quite an intellectual experience for the adult reading it to a child because you're constantly swapping it back and forth and thinking, wait, why did that character make me feel uncomfortable? Or why is that funny? Or, wow, I didn't notice it that way round. And the child, they're getting introduced to completely new characters who are actually missing. We've noticed some real gaps in these characters' representation in current literature and films. Yeah, huge gaps, huge gaps. The stories and the characters were absolutely people and and plots that we we never see. And first of all, I just want to say, Jonathan, your dad sounds like a real <laughs> groundbreaker in this area. That's amazing that he did that. I love that story. And I also love that that stemmed from that horrible, I do remember that, that news article and the conversation that stemmed from that. I had no idea that's where this came from. And I also like the idea of applying your algorithm to the entire world. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's been, I'm kind of hoping that like, it's, you know, we sort of say like with the book, we're not trying to create this perfect world. That world is still kind of totally broken in just in the opposite way. So I remember getting my like feminism goggles and then never being able to watch a film again without Sorry. analyzing it. <laughs> and I ruined like, it. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I, I'm hoping we can give some people some gender swapping goggles. So the idea is you read the book and then you're thinking about this sort of thing. What would the world be like gender swapped? And you can go off and watch the news or watch, you know, read a history book, read, read anything in modern fiction and think about it and think, oh, what would that be like gender swapped and see if that reveals something strange about it that you didn't notice the right way around because we're just so used to it the right way around there's a lot of strange stuff that it's not until you swap it it allows you to see it i love that idea gender swapped goggles i wish that, <laughs> that those existed um and i'm gonna ask my next question in a second but i just want to say it sounds so small right to just swap the genders it's just such a small thing but these stories were so powerful that I honestly, I teared up <laughs> reading some of them because oh. it was so refreshing to just see women as the default and to see them be strong and brave and making the decisions, saving the boys and men. I remember reading some and the queens were calling on their work women to come build their castles. And <laughs> it was just, it's absolutely beautiful. So Thank you for your work. That's really sweet of you. And I'm really glad that, you know, you had that response to it. I think one of the interesting things is when I read them, I often think, where are the men? I'm like, come on, you introduced the number <laughs> character you've introduced and it's a woman. And I actually think, like, I actually get a bit yes. of like, this is ridiculous. There's just so many women in this story. And then I remember, no, there's literally, yes. where are the, you know, like in, we're just seeing man after man after man being introduced and, this is what we get even in modern TV now. You know, you, you're asking, well, who is the woman who wasn't just a girlfriend or someone propping up a male character when they actually have something that they want and a backstory? And often you can watch a whole 
There's many, many TV series which are just man after man after man. I mean, The Wire, <laughs> which everyone loves, right? Or The Gruffalo, which, again, incredibly important work, very modern, written by a woman. The very first Gruffalo, there was five characters. None of them were female. I mean, it's crazy. That's such a good point, though, that you notice it when it's swapped. Like, yeah. I mean, that'll you feel obviously... You be... by the two men yeah. women. I mean, and I'm a feminist, and I was thinking, a bit... A bit over the top with the women. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but like you say, unless you have those feminist goggles on and you're really using them, you might not notice when it is all men. So yeah, and that's yeah. really going to be a theme, I think, throughout this conversation and definitely throughout the book. Things just continue to jump out at you. I think the reason that happens is because it's swapping absolutely everything. Like there are fairy tales that are rewritten. Like so many fairy tales have been rewritten and the sort of, quite feminist retellings like brave like the pixar movie it's about the sort of princess who just wants to ride a horse and jump around that kind of thing but ultimately she's still in this world which doesn't want her to do that so she's still fighting this world and so because like, everything's swapped they're swapped but it's also totally fine that they're swapped and everyone's just like oh you're brave cool oh the men are just caring and nice to people oh that's cool. <laughs> they're not you know often like if a male character takes on the female traits they get like they piss taken out of them it's sort of you know, laughed yeah. at this is just oh they're just loving and they're just a kind father and everyone's fine about it <laughs> Shame, we're not letting you ask any of your questions <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, that's okay i mean i, I don't know how many of your questions he's answered <laughs> you've answered all the important ones <laughs> i just want you to keep telling us about everything that you see because that's a great point that you just made that in the revisiting of these, even if you have a strong female character, she's often sat within the context of a society that doesn't necessarily welcome that. And she has to push against that. And your whole stories are a whole different context. So it's not just those individual characters, but the whole context. Yeah, well, this is the thing which we see, like, when I thought about what was going to happen to these stories, instantly, I thought, okay, we're going to have a princess going and saving a prince. And we have actually seen that. This is quite a common trope with like, you know, the books which we get my daughter like the worst princess and things like that the princess is now wearing you know muddy trainers and using a sword and doesn't care about pretty dresses and rides the dragon we see that in many books now it's a completely accepted trope you've got that in brave but i think the problem is we're not seeing the kind-hearted sensitive passive princes when they're not mocked, they're not laughed at. They can be rescued, they can be self-sacrificing, they can be paternal to children. These are traits which are unacceptable. So everyone's allowed to move over to the masculine traits in society. You know, you can be a woman being a CEO or having power or being strong, but only strong in a masculine sense. And what is left is a giant gap of everyone allowing to have feminine traits and to be celebrated for traditionally seen as feminine traits. That's so true. And absolutely, yeah, reflection of our real world, because we value masculine traits and devalue feminine traits, generally speaking, right? So it's a lot easier for women to be more stereotypically masculine to an extent, obviously not pushing that too far yeah. um, than it is for men. So that that was actually that can lead me to the next question, because I did want to ask you if it felt more uncomfortable positively portraying, you know, pretty and passive princes, I think, as you put it in, in the introduction of the book, pretty and passive princes, even that saying, you know, that doesn't come off the tongue easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, it was really creepy, because I was drawing them. And I was with the fairy tale book, particularly, I realized that all the men I was drawing were teenage boys. They were like 16, 14, sometimes, right? So when you mentioned yeah. their ages, and they were just like a little pretty boys. And I was just drawing pretty teenage boys all the time. And it felt really creepy. <laughs> and then you realize, my God, like literally we're like doing that for teenage girls. And that is equickly creepy. Yeah. <laughs> it's not acceptable. But it's just all over Hollywood all the time. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And the catwalk, right? Yeah. The yeah. girls on the catwalk age 13, 14. And yeah, good question. Do you see boys on the catwalk age 13, 14, like walking for Gucci? I very much, very much doubt it. 
But you know, like I think that that's that's really interesting, isn't it? You start mm. really looking at society and finding those gaps there. I mean, I think with you, with the fatherhood thing, that was quite clear, wasn't it? Yeah, it's interesting. We were just at a book event the other day, and I, I could tell there were two sort of dads came over to the to the stall, and I, I sort of started talking to them about the fatherhood thing. I think they initially thought, oh, you know, maybe this book isn't for me, and I just started talking to them about sort of fatherhood angle in the book. There's a question we often ask, like, can you think of any story in history of uh, fiction or nonfiction, which is about a man desperately wanting to have a baby, but not like for an heir, not just because they want like a mm. male heir to take over. And the only answer we've ever got was Pinocchio. There aren't any other story except how Even many men are there in real life. You know, like we had to do IVF for our first child. And sort of once you start talking about that, you realize there's loads of people going through that who have loads of men desperately wanting to have children, not represented in culture at all. Like, ever. <laughs> Even in modern culture. I mean, I find that so sad. But in gender swap fairy tales, we've got three. Was it three? three? It might be four. It might be sure. four men. The story starts off with a man who desperately wants to be a father. It's just so strange. Again, like, we're all talking about strong women. Mm-hmm. Or fighting and becoming CEOs. We're not talking about men being fathers. It's just mad. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, if not more important, because exactly as you say, there are no stories that fit in that realm. We have lots of stories about women, no stories like this about boys. And that that is crazy to think about, that there's maybe one story that exists where a man wants a child that doesn't have to do with an heir. Anyone else listening has any other Yeah. Because we haven't had any. Yeah, we've had hundreds of people, but we always ask and we'd love to. You know, I think the main thing is that they they need to be the main protagonist and it needs to be their story. You get some Mm. stories about IVF where the woman and the man are going through it together. But yeah, very few and just at the man's angle. I think that's so interesting. I think that's the thing about the gender swapping algorithm is because a lot of people, they swap the stories and then they really want to rewrite them because lots of people are writers and the temptation to write is huge. And there's amazing rewrites of especially Greek myth. There's a lot of, I mean, well, both genres. There's a huge amount of really amazing writers rewriting them. But they're still succumbing to biases. I mean, and you know, we're card carrying feminists here, but we're still succumbing to biases constantly. And I think the interesting thing about letting the computer swap it is regardless of your political outlook, regardless if you are a card carrying feminist or you've never thought about gender before, you're suddenly confronted with this world where you have to make the observation. We're not preaching to anybody we're not trying to make them think anything we're just doing this act with the computer and giving the results to the reader to read i think that what makes it really interesting but it does make you realize there's huge gaps in feminism and how we're talking about gender and i mean one thing which we notice at the moment is our book sits alongside a lot of feminist children books in the bookshop and what you get a lot of you'll see it everywhere is stories of women who have become very famous and successful for doing different jobs. You've got Ada Lovelace or Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama, or Coco Chanel or Frida Kahlo, you know, whatever that is, you've got successful women having gained success despite fighting against the patriarchal system, which is brilliant. And we do need to hear about these people. But what you're not seeing mm. is stories of men who were fathers and raised six children single-handedly and would never acknowledge and never receive the prize and never became famous and never got any money and they went to their grave having made a difference to those six children's lives. You don't hear stories about men who were carers, who worked in social work, you know, looked after the elderly, looked after the children, were teachers. All we're hearing is the definition of masculine success, of becoming rich, famous, recognised... And that isn't what, what, why are we accepting that version of society of success? This is what feminism for children looks like today. If you go into the, the children's bookshops and what I'd love to see is that also swapped, you know, so that we are hearing stories about other versions of success and other attitudes to what children should be doing to become good citizens and to make the world better. 
Absolutely. Well, it looks like you guys are going to have your hands full then. You got a lot of things to be start swapping. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get busy. <laughs> and then we might need to find you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a great, great point, though. And hopefully, you know, the work that you're doing will will start having these conversations and spark ideas for other people who can help take this work on and start telling these other stories. But I want to I want to pause for a minute. And I want to ask why you chose fairy tales and why Greek myths specifically. Obviously, the idea kind of started with politics and news. So why did you end up landing on fairy tales and Greek myths? You do this one. You're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> you tell. You spin a good yarn about the fairy tales. <laughs> okay, so with fairy tales, I think that these are really like important texts which we read to our children, which we read ourselves. They're some of the first stories we ever hear. They're some of the best stories. They've stood the test of time. They've gone through oral traditions, being told and retold, and you know, change slightly with each telling. And actually Greek myths as well, you know, Greek myths sometimes predate the fairy tales and they go back 4,000 years. So we're looking at texts which are very foundational to our society, which give birth to archetypes, which we see today. We're still getting princess stories with Disney, which children still love. We're still getting stories of heroes, like hyper-masculine heroes and all the superhero stories, which come from the Greek myths. We're still getting, you know, a lot of those tropes. And also, these are stories which you can examine language in. They're slightly different target audiences. I think, like, the fairy tales are slightly younger and the Greek myths are slightly more psychologically complex. Well, maybe that's not the right word. They're both quite psychologically complex. <laughs> but they're amazing stories as well. We're not These stories are talking about power relations. They're talking about money. They're talking about fighting demons and monsters. They're really important stories to us as humans. Mm-hmm. But we're trying to think, well, why have these specific stories stood the test of time? Why do we still like to tell them? What are they teaching us? What are we teaching children through retelling them? And why are they important to our current culture? So that's why we chose the fairy tales and myths. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly as you say, I think they really form the basis of all of the stories that we continue to see today. And the point of these types of stories are really meant to teach lessons, right? Moral lessons. That's not just about entertainment, but it's always also been about teaching a moral lesson, a lesson wrapped in a story. So really what we have are biased gender stereotypes wrapped in lessons of the stories as well. So I feel like that makes it also especially insidious and important that these Mm. are the types of stories that you're looking at. Absolutely. And they're over 4,000 years old, but you all are the first people to really do this type of work, right? Does anything like this exist? You've mentioned Brave and a few that kind of, you know, reimagine it a little bit, but is there anything else out there like this? I couldn't, you know, you can never say there's nothing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, haven't searched endlessly, but I think we're the first to just try swapping it without rewriting it. Yeah. I think that's the. That's I mean, the key we definitely, difference. when we just, came up with the idea, we thought the same thing. We were like, surely somebody's done this. Yeah, and right? It's like there. so obvious, doesn't it? And yeah. Googled, 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 we Googled the it. hell out of it and we couldn't find anything where they. We, we found rewrites. That's obviously, we've got a grand tradition of rewriting and retelling because these stories are, even, you know, the Greek myths, even the ones which were first written 3,000, 4,000 years ago, they're still come from oral tradition they've still been retold in slightly different ways and there's many variants so I think that's quite nice to remember that we are just doing something which has been done throughout history with these stories we said like in our our most recent book they're not like relics in the museum which are untouchable but the nice thing especially about the Greek ones I I was saying the other day it was kind of weird sitting there you know at a laptop rewriting these stories that have been around for like 4,000 years and now I'm kind of like is this okay (laughs) but yeah like even the people we think of as having written them probably didn't write some of you know they were they were reinterpreting Mm. what they'd heard orally they might have been around for way longer than that no one's even sure how long they went back before that so yeah it's this kind of retelling and each one being gradually adapted to different cultures and as they moved around Greece they were adapted to you know those cultures so so yeah. I decided that it was okay that I was doing it on the laptop. <laughs> I told myself that it's More fine. than okay. 
<laughs> it's necessary and it's about damn time. <laughs> So do you have any favorite stories or maybe a few that kind of stood out to you most after the algorithm did its thing? I'm wondering, you know, you've painted the picture quite well of a few of the anecdotes and dynamics that exist, but any examples that you care to mention to really bring it to light to listeners? I'll tell you one from fairy tale, then you can say one from Greek myth. Yeah, okay. So I think... For the fairy tale, that was the first book which we swapped. And I think, like, one of the ones which really stood out for us both was Handsome and the Beast, which, when swapped, became... First of all, the original version isn't quite like the Disney one. It's a bit different. Beauty, originally, is trapped in this kind of house which by the beast and the palace, and it, every room seems to kind of grant her materialistic desires. But when we swap the story, I mean, first of all, you're introduced to the mother, the matriarch of the family, as the merchant. So instantly your brain thinks the yeah. merchant is going to be a man. And then when you start hearing the she pronoun, that surprises you. But then so the merchant goes off. She's going off on a journey and she says to all her children, can I bring you back anything? And all of her other daughters and sons say, oh, can you bring us an expensive gift and we want jewellery and clothes? And then she says to Handsome, do you want anything? And he's the youngest son. And he says, oh, don't worry about me. All I want is a rose. He sacrifices himself. He says, don't worry. I don't, you know, just a rose. She goes and tries to get the rose from the beast's garden. The beast says, I won't let you go unless you bring me one of your, your sons to marry. She goes back and she says, ah, this beast wants one of my sons to marry. And again, handsome, self-sacrifices himself. Don't worry, mom. I'll go. Don't worry about me. (laughs) Off he goes. He trots to be held captive by this horrible beast. And the beast, she is ugly. She is angry. She's charmless. Every night she forces him to eat with her. And every day she demands that he marries her and... And then when somehow, for some reason, he says no, she's really angry about it. (laughs) (laughs) Just totally charming. Again, like how wonderful that the woman gets to be ugly and angry, but loved despite her flaws. Yes. That is just, again, you don't see that. You don't see Mm -hmm. a woman being ugly and angry and loved despite her flaws. You see plenty of tropes of the genius male like Johnny Cash or whoever, you know, the biopic when they're, they're terrible to their woman, but they're just misunderstood, tortured geniuses. And they've always got yes. a wife who's just like at home rocking the baby. You know, we see this again and again in pretty much every film about any man who made it. So anyway, so this is Flip now. So then the beast eventually gets, she's not done anything to charm handsome whatsoever. I don't think she pulled any smooth moves at any point in the story. <laughs> Sorry to spoil it. But eventually, Handsome, he's allowed out for a little bit and he goes and sees his family. But then he has a dream that the beast is not well. And he says, I'm not going to have my freedom anymore. I'm going to rush to the beast's side and make sure she's okay and look after her and nurture her. For the third time, he's self-sacrificing and eventually falls in love with her, even though she's done nothing charming whatsoever. She's held him captive. She's been ugly and angry. And yeah, he loves her despite all of this. And I think it's such an interesting lesson in a man being self-sacrificing. Mm. Which I don't but, think but also seen. having to see past ugliness to the beauty within, you know, that's a message that's often given the women have to do. But in this case, it's the man having to see past the flaws and see the beauty within all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. so interesting. There's so much to go for that story. And you've got one for the Greek myth. Yeah, so it's not the most obvious story. You know, if I just picked the stories that I like the most initially, it would be a different one. But this was just a really interesting gender swap because it was very unexpected. It was a story that we initially, well, actually, I read the beginning and almost dismissed it because it was already a, what seemed like a sort of feminist story. It was originally called Atalanta. So it was about a girl who's raised by bears and becomes this sort of fleet footed huntress. So it immediately sort of seemed like, oh, maybe this won't work very well. But when you swap it, it's actually perfect. It's it's so interesting. So it starts off with this little boy who is rejected by his parents for being a boy. They wanted a girl. And then they sort of say, if only only it was a girl, she could be a queen. She could do this. We could teach her that. But, oh, it's a boy. It's no good at all. So they decide to leave him on the mountainside to die. 
and um, a, a, a he bear comes along and starts to look after him. A he bear! <laughs> and looks after him and raises him. <sighs> And he turns into this fleet-footed huntress, because this was the other thing with this one where it's like male version was she was a hunter, so he's now a huntress, and taking on the default female version. And she, um, so he he now, <laughs> so confusing trying to describe the stories like that. Um, he then is summoned at one point. There's a giant sow that's tearing up the landscape, ruining all the villages and killing all the women. So the queen summons all the people from the land to come and try and kill it. And he goes along. But when he gets there, the queen and all the other fighting women won't go and hunt with him. They say that if they were seen hunting with a man, they'd be a laughing stock. And they, uh, they, they say, maybe you don't want to go and hunt. Maybe you want to go and just sort of play with your toys in the garden. So, you know, there's quite a lot more to that story. It goes on. But you get the idea that this is a story I'd never seen. This is a man fighting against the matriarchy, a man being told, you're not allowed to be brave and you're not allowed to be strong like the women. I'd just never seen that world before, which was sort of quite amusing for me, enlightening. John talks about creating an empathy machine, you know, the way to just see the other side and to see what is it like to be told the stories from the other side. And I think that's what makes it yeah. really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I talk a lot about, I made the algorithm primarily for myself, you know, as a sort of white man in the world. Yeah. It's kind of interesting to try and, it's, it's hard, it's, empathy's difficult, isn't it? You know, that's why it's, yeah. a, it's I, rather than swapping your own thoughts, you swap the whole world and then you can see what it would be like. <laughs> and then you cannot ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like thinking of it like that, an empathy machine, because it, it really forces it. Like, you can't ignore it when it's like that. And you really see the power imbalances in plain light when that happens. So I think it's wonderful. And those are two great examples. And I also like, and you kind of mentioned this at the beginning, but the whole point is that you're not creating a utopia by switching it. It's to draw out and show the flaws and the power imbalances. And I think that's a really important thing. And it kind of stems into feminism as well, because a lot of times that narrative gets distorted or misrepresented as, you know, oh, women want to take over the world. But you know, maybe that would solve some problems, but it really that's not what it's what it's about. It's not about swapping out one oppressive system for another. It's about creating an entirely new system altogether. So I like how your stories really aren't creating equitable societies that we can kind of model off of, but instead are bringing to light everything that's flawed with our existing one. So yeah, I think the interesting thing is it highlights the skewed power dynamic, which flipped in the opposite direction. I think we've had the occasional comment when somebody saw the cover and said it looks woke. And I love just saying like, we're not advocating that, you know, <laughs> little boys should be hunted down in the wood by lady wolves <laughs> and that, you know, queens of the underworld should grab their husbands and run off and capture them. This is not a woke world. <laughs> that is yeah. not a happy place for equality. What we always say would be really interesting is for people to take these swapping algorithms and try it on, you know, race swapping or class swapping or sexuality yeah. swapping there's so many things which you can look for unequal dynamics and narratives and text and swap them to reveal those power dynamics yeah totally totally i think we need that too so whew, we got a lot of swapping to do and i also think all the movies need to be swapped too i i think oh, i would love great. to do that i mean like i don't know you know, it's not as easy with the movies, with text, it's much yeah. simpler. But we did see one gender swap when they took the images from Batman Catwoman game. They swapped them. So Batman was now moving exactly like Catwoman and he sort of shoulders back, prowling in. And he's like, what, and the words he's saying, and he's, oh, it's just hilarious. It's yeah. really funny when you see that. That is quite easy because you can take the code and yeah. the movement. Yeah, so it's like they'd taken the animation from Batman and put it on Catwoman, the animation from Catwoman and put it on Batman. So Catwoman was just standing very still and, you know, just talking and Batman was wiggling his bum around a lot. Flouncing around. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my God. Okay. So animated might be a little easier. It might be difficult, but we can do it. So any creators out there, anybody looking for a project? We want someone to gender for Paw Patrol, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like to a lot. That's an animation which could do with some gender swapping. 100%. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. Let's get that. Let's get some... Penelope Pan, Trakina, <laughs> Lion Queen. Uh, it's one of the things people sometimes say is, oh, you know, fairy tales, it's, that's a really gendered thing anyway. So, you know, if you swap that, it's gonna, obviously it would make a good swap, but it's really not. If you start looking at everything, you'll realize that pretty much yeah. everything would make a really good swap. Pretty much everything would make a really good swap. Yeah, that's true. Let's let's swap our governments while we're at it. <laughs> <laughs> So what, if any, what challenges did you face in swapping the tax? Was there anything that you came up against that was difficult to work around? Technically, there were a few challenges and then there were a few sort of creative challenges as well. So the technical challenges were not quite so interesting. It just turns out English is a little bit weird in some places and things like <laughs> hers and him and his sort of all swap backwards and forwards between each other in some kind of weird way, which I had to figure out to make the algorithm work. But the kind of more interesting challenges were the sort of the, the things that came up. We had to make decisions. So there was one in the fairy tales, which was about a hag. The, oh yeah, the, yeah. I wasn't, wasn't going to say that one. So that's actually better. Oh so yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So, so there's a certain word which we were really surprised to discover there weren't the male <gasps> equivalent or the female oh. equivalent. So hag was one of them. So we were trying oh. to find a derogatory term for an old man. Oh my um, gosh. And again, you know, there's quite a lot of slightly, yeah. you know, derogatory words for old women and not for men. And we ended up having to settle on the word. We swapped hag for old codger, which is like, <laughs> I, as an American, you probably don't even know what that is. Never heard that. Yeah. And it sort of isn't really offensive. It's kind of like, oh, yeah, old codger, you know, like sort of um, a cheeky chap. I mean, the people call old women hags nowadays as an offensive word, and it's really interesting that that didn't exist. Makes you wonder, though, if the world had been swapped, maybe you old, your old hag would have been like just a friendly way of just... <laughs> yeah. And then in, the, <laughs> in Greek myth, you had the bachelors as well. Oh, yeah, that was a really fun one. The Minotaur story, the people going off to be fed to the Minotaur are originally youths and maidens. So initially that seemed like quite an easy swap. So we just changed it to maidens and youths. It would just be the women going first in the sentence. But then when we actually started thinking about it, so youth is one thing, but maiden carries a lot of different weight to it. So maiden talks about your virginity and your marital status. So we kind of thought long and hard about a word for that. And we ended up with bachelors and youths. <laughs> but bachelor, again, there's no word which talks about men's virginal and marital status at the same time. No bachelor you think of oh he was a bit of a bachelor you know and you know you imagine somebody who's maybe rich and, and you know, probably not a virgin and probably not a virgin. <laughs> probably very much not a virgin and like yeah it's just really interesting again like the gaps in our linguistics is fascinating yeah that's so true that's so true we need more words so you're <laughs> yeah. yeah really bringing to light that we need more stories with different characters different storylines but we also need more words in order to tell these stories wow we need some linguists to go invent them for us <laughs> all right so we're recruiting filmmakers <laughs> uh, computer programmers linguists uh who else do we need illustrators so Carrie, i wanted to ask you about so you did all the illustrations which are absolutely beautiful and they really bring the stories to life even more and you know to see these passive princes and these warrior women drawn out is just fantastic as well so can you tell us what that was like drawing these stories in reverse or swapped Thank you. That's nice to hear. I never went to art college, so it's nice. <laughs> Thanks for somebody said something nice about your art. Thank you. you didn't. No. My parents oh my wanted me to get an academic degree, and then I punished them by constantly drawing, <laughs> <laughs> trying to move back to the art world. Oh, they're beautiful. Um, yeah, so, I mean, what a brilliant brief. I get to, you know, I was just saying, like, the child version of me would have just loved this, to be able to 
make a living from drawing like women monsters and warriors and I mean it is a joy with um, gender swap Greek myth which is the most recent one I got to draw a minor heifer with like <laughs> udders and a woman's body and a cow's head and I got to draw Medusa as a man with a sneaky beard. I mean, it was great fun. And also, like, you feel that you're creating images which aren't being shown before and maybe haven't been shown. So the way that I create the images and research them is, is similar to John's algorithm. I, first of all, make a file and I look at every single image of these stories, which I can find online. And with the Greek myth, if they go back to medieval times, they have medieval minotaurs which is amazing to see so people have been visualizing these stories for centuries so I make a file of all of those and then I get my sketchbook out and I just try gender swapping those images with just in a little rough sketch and I just look at how that changes the dynamics and the power so often the women are in passive poses or over-sexualized poses, their necks are exposed, the clothes are falling off their body. <laughs> it's really interesting. So once I've kind of researched in that way, I start creating my own images and I really try and emphasize the power imbalance between the two characters. And I use watercolors, inks, pens and paint to create the images and I sort of create a very strong contrasting color palette for each image but they're an absolute joy to make absolute joy oh and I like to talk about with the new book gender sort Greek myth I like to talk about the research I did for the Persephone and Hades story which in researching it I came across 20 classical paintings of Hades abducting Persephone and they all showed Persephone not fighting back. She's just limply hanging off Hades' back, maybe placing a hand gently on his shoulder. Her arms are flailing around like a rag doll. I mean, for 20 paintings to exist throughout history <sighs> and none of them to show her actually fighting, it's fascinating. I mean, what are we telling people? And it, when I swapped that and I drew this, like, rag doll man, you know, beautiful man being dragged off just with his arms flailing in the air it just looks so weird oh yeah I bet but that again it's another way of just forcing you to look at how messed up it is that all of those paintings historically and the story itself and all of that 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 is how the girls the women are portrayed and we don't think anything of it so just like the stories in the text bring that to light I thought your images really just bring all of that to light as well. And and they were a joy to look at. So I'm glad you got a joy in creating them. <laughs> Thank you. We all get joy in looking at them. And I'm curious what the, you mentioned some people, you know, saying that they think this might be a little bit too woke for them. But overall, what is the response from people? What has the response been for both of these? Books? I mean, really good. We got to do a second one. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> pretty good sign. We launched the yeah. first book, like literally on the first day, which we went into lockdown and we were just like... Literally the day the bookshop closed, that was when we launched. <laughs> so I was oh like, my God. oh my goodness. Like we put it back a couple of months because we thought the pandemic would all be sorted out. But yeah, it just really, it just does really well online as well. You know, people like instantly get the idea and they're interested. And what's nice is the readers are sharing their observations about it. Yeah, we really like seeing that as well. I think that often people come up with things that we still haven't noticed, so it's really nice to see. Well, one other thing that was really nice about the reception was it was kind of accepted across the board, which was great. We got a positive review in The Guardian, which is a very kind of left-wing paper, and we even got a positive review in The Daily Mail, which is a very right-wing paper. <laughs> wow. <laughs> which is right. a sort of borderline miracle. But that's kind of the point. We didn't want to make a book that was just preaching to the choir to the people who already agreed with it. We wanted to make it something that you could give as a gift maybe to kind of anyone, someone who's very thinking about gender and their role in the world or someone who's literally never thought about it at all. And it could be something that would be interesting to either of them. I think the younger generations are much more aware of pronouns and they're non-binary now and there's an understanding of gender being a social construct 
But at the same time, this is a book which they could give to somebody who isn't from that culture or who's from a different generation, different culture. And that person can see themselves reflected in the story and understand that maybe they've been limited or like a man, right, can really understand why gender is an important subject for them as well and how they might actually be confined to certain roles. We always talk about this book being binary busting. We want to shine a light on the binary nature of masculinity and femininity in our culture. And at the same time, we don't want the book to be just preaching to the choir. We want it to cross that binary divide and to make people think about it. Binary busting. I love that. (laughs) I love that. And yeah, it really does transcend political affiliation, age, I guess, just like fairy tales and Greek myths, right? Are stories meant for everyone? This is kind of the same. That's a really beautiful thing. So you've kind of answered this throughout, but I just want to ask you pointedly and hear how you talk about the importance of this book. Why do you think these books are important? We sort of envisioned this book as part book, part activism, and part like art object. We kind of like to see this book as like it's fallen through some kind of wormhole from some other universe where women are in charge and have always been and create an object like that. You know, it's not to be laughed at. It's not like a jokey thing. It's a serious book which looks at narrative language and archetypes which have permeated our culture for centuries and kind of unpack that. But the reason which we think the book's important is because we hope ultimately that people will go on and feel empowered to swap their own stories to not take the stories we're being told in films, on TV, in the adverts we see, the literature we read today, to not just take it as given and to see it as something which they have the right to go in, to change, to swap, to subvert and find their own way of critically looking at the narratives which we receive today. So that's what we want. We want people to be their own activists, to make their own observations and to go out and inspect their own narratives love it jonathan anything you want to add to that one that felt pretty comprehensive (laughs) (laughs) i said all the words all the words all the words (laughs) (laughs) amazing is there anything else that you all before i start getting to the recurring questions at the end is there anything else that you all wanted to talk about or mention or tell us that we haven't covered today I think one of your questions, which is quite important to say, is you did ask us about our definition of gender. And mm-hmm. I think that is always really important to say that even though it's called gender swap fairy tales, we don't think there's only two genders to swap. For the purpose of this book, we see gender very much as a social construct, unlike sex. And by shining a light on this gender binary, we can start thinking critically about how so much of our culture is uh, bin- binarized, is that a word? <laughs> it will be. Um, you know, into masculinity and femininity. But of course, nowadays, I think people are beginning to realize that there's all sorts of multitudes of gender identity, from trans to queer to agendered to non binary. There's many different opportunities to subvert this traditional masculine feminine role and i think that's important to talk about definitely over 60 i think or so different yeah now there's a website somewhere which said yeah. there's 64 and counting i'm sure there's going to be more and counting exactly so yeah excellent point and you guys do draw that out in the beginning of your books and i think it's really important and again really your work brings to light how it is socially constructed how made up all of these rules for gendered rules are jonathan anything else that you wanted to talk about today that we haven't covered or was that quite comprehensive as well yeah i think we've covered all the things we we normally like to talk about with the book so we just kind of like rambled on about whatever we fancy talking about already, <laughs> sorry you had so many good questions as well. <laughs> sorry is there, anything, is there anything we forgot to talk about because we were too busy just telling we get overexcited <laughs> about it. yeah 
Are you kidding me? Do you know how easy that makes the interview? All I have to do is sit here and, you know, give you a little prompt and then you give these wonderful answers. It's perfect. Feminism was established so as to allow unattractive women easier access to the mainstream. Bitter, nasty, ugly, man-hating, empty horror show. Lesbianic sort of feminism. Which is what feminazism was essentially all about. And now for The Feminism Gets a Bad Rap Because the Narrative Has Been Just a Bit One-Sided Corner. All right. So just for some rapid fire questions to wrap up, these are questions that I asked every guest at the end. And I guess if you want to each answer the questions, I'm happy with that. If you want to go back and forth, I'm happy with that. So however you like. Okay. (laughs) What does feminism mean to you? (laughs) (laughs) Um. Okay, so like when this is supposed to be rapid fire, isn't it? Like when when Karen and I first met, I wouldn't have called myself a feminist, primarily because I didn't really understand what feminism meant. I thought it was all this stuff that it wasn't really. And then when I finally realized it just meant, do you believe that men and women should basically be treated the same and have the same rights and opportunities? I was like, oh, yeah, of course I'm a feminist then. (laughs) So (laughs) look it up in the dictionary and see if that that was my past self. (laughs) (laughs) Let all the stuff around it and find out what it actually is. It's hard to object to. (laughs) Yes, love it. (laughs) Unfortunately, you're very far from the only person who who does not understand the definition of it. But I'm very glad that we have you on our side now. (laughs) (laughs) What is one of your earliest memories of gender a time when you realized the world didn't treat girls and boys the same Mm, good question well again for me i think i realized all this stuff quite late if you're a man just sort of growing up you can just not think about it and not worry about it for quite a while until you start thinking about it so i don't Mm. really it's kind of weird that i don't have any really early memories of that particularly no, I think that's just quite indicative, <laughs> really. It's a good question, but even I'm struggling to go back and remember mm. something specific. I think definitely from a, a young age, I'm a gobby girl. <laughs> <laughs> and there's definitely a lot of pushback from education and peers and everything that I shouldn't be loud and giving my opinion and I think that if I was aware of that from a very young age that I was too loud and too talkative and that boys who were loud and talkative as well didn't get that pushback yeah well it's good that you have to think a little bit in order to come up with that memory I would say and then a few easier questions uh what are you all reading right now <laughs> I'm reading children's books. Me and my sister are working on something at the moment. And I'm reading a lot of like nine to 12 year old books, which is, yeah, I've not read that for ages. Our oldest daughter's five. So we're still sort of in the picture book stage. So yeah, that is an eye opener for me and comics. I'm actually a comic artist. So I usually tell my own stories with pictures and words. I've just returned from the Lakes International Comics Art Festival, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous festival, comic festival. And I bought a bunch of amazing graphic novels, which I love. Cyberman being one of them, which is the story of a woman observing, it's a documentary graphic novel. She's observing a middle-aged depressive man who decided to live his entire life online and it's very observational and kind of rear view mirror-ish and beautiful and sad nice one jonathan anything you're reading um i'm mostly listening to audiobooks at the moment trying to fit oh, things nice. in between, between yeah children. <laughs> a <laughs> little busy with the kids yeah I'm listening to the moment i've been listening i'm kind of uh, binge listening to the expanse series so like sci-fi strange alien future where we've colonized half the solar system and it's um, Ooh. Quite, quite interesting is gender any better in the future i was gonna ask yeah i was i was thinking i was thinking about that it's actually got some pretty good female characters in it the leader of earth is a woman and she's yeah happy. Well, she swears all the time and is really rude to everybody but is like a genius so yeah she's a good character 
The main character is still a man, but they do have some good female characters in there. We <laughs> always like talking about the futuristic or even like fantasy stories like Game of Thrones when they can imagine a world with dragons and wolves, but they can't wrap their hands around a world where the patriarchy doesn't exist. <laughs> oh my God, that is so true. That is so true. <laughs> All right, so there's another one to swap. Okay, <laughs> our list is long. <laughs> so is there anything you mentioned you're working on something with your sister? Is there anything that you all are working on now that you would like to share? I think everything's a little bit half-baked at the moment. Yeah, I'm we've fine. got a few fingers and pies. Um, <laughs> like I said, I'm a comic artist and graphic novelist. And with this book, I was an illustrator. But usually I'm telling my own stories. And I do a lot of, of different comics with different people. So the best place to find our work is for me. I have Instagram, which is at Carrie Franceman. You are on... So Twitter on, mostly. On, yeah, so on Twitter I'm at John Plackett, no H, it's J-O-N-P-L-A-C-K-E-T-T. We've both got websites as well where we always update with the various projects we're doing. We produce quite a lot of different stuff. Uh, my stuff is all visual storytelling and John is all kind of so, experimental, playful, techie. Yeah, so any, anything involving new technology and also some kind of fun, creative use of it then I'll be all over that. So, making... so your website is? Plackett.co.uk. And mine is carriefranceman.com and it's K-A-R-R-I-E-F-R-A-N-S-M-A-N. Lovely. And I will put all of that in the show notes as well. Thank you, Carrie and Jonathan, for your time. This has been an absolute pleasure. I've really, really enjoyed speaking with oh. you and I can't wait to buy everyone your books for Christmas. Oh, thanks yeah. so much for inviting thanks, us to chat Thanks so much to you. for having us on. Yeah. And thanks for so many like thoughtful questions. Absolutely. Thanks for the very thoughtful and necessary books. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. The Story of Woman is a one-woman operation, so if you enjoyed this episode, there are a few small things you can do that make a big difference in helping other people find the podcast and allowing me to continue putting out new episodes. You can subscribe, leave a review, share with a friend, follow on socials, become a Patreon for access to bonus interviews and other content, buy me a metaphorical coffee, which helps with production funds, or head to the website and check out the bookstore filled with hundreds of books like this one. If you purchase any book through the links on the website, you support this podcast and local bookstores. So feel free to do all your shopping there. All these options are in the show notes. Anything you can do is appreciated and makes a big difference in elevating women from the footnotes of our story to the main narrative.